I first saw Prabhupada in the summer of uh, 1966. Uh, my my roommate, which was Howard Wheeler or Hayagriva, uh, later, uh, was walking on Second Avenue, and, or walking to Second Avenue, and he ran in, in ran into Prabhupada on the on the street, around Bowery, and. Uh, Uh, High Griever recognized his pointed shoes and so forth as, uh, and the dress as, like a holy man. And he spoke to him. He says, oh, are you a holy man? Or are you from, in actually he said, are you from India? And Prabhupada said, yes, are you from India? <laughs> and Howard said, no, uh, but I just came back. My roommate and I, uh, we took a trip to India. And uh, then Prabhupada told him that he was holding classes on 2nd Avenue, 26 2nd Avenue, and, and invited uh, him to come and bring his friends. So uh, Hayagriva came back and told me, and uh, we decided to go and check it out. So that next Wednesday or Friday night, whatever it was, uh, we went to the 26th Ave, Second Avenue storefront, and that's the first place I saw Prabhupada. He came through that door and sat down. I was going to say on the, on the raised platform, but there was no raised platform at that stage. He just sat down on the floor. When he came to Buffalo, which was six months later, or in the spring of 69, <clears throat> By that time, I'd been living in the temple for some time, six months or so, and uh, he he was staying at the uh, <clears throat> at an apartment nearby. An Indian man had let him use his apartment while he was there in Buffalo. At that time, I got initiated. But I remember sitting in in the back and and watching Prabhupada behind his desk and, uh, and trying to understand, you know, trying to kind of penetrate his uh, mystery of. It. And suddenly I was looking like that, kind of trying to penetrating, and, and he looked up and he saw me looking at him. And he said, yes. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I was caught, you know, that I was kind of uh, intruding in a sense. And then, then I lowered my eyes and I realized I was, I couldn't know him in that way, but I had to get, somehow get his mercy if I wanted to really get to know him better. We didn't have Mongol RT at 4.30 or 5 in those days. It was actually more like 7 o'clock. But still, it was uh, a very full day. And on this one morning, Prabhupada asked if we were chanting 16 rounds, all of us. Now, we'd been initiated already. So I answered very honestly, well, not always. We try. And then I, I said that, you know, somehow we were finding it difficult. Prabhupada said, difficult? Why difficult? And so I was answering, well, I, it seemed like, you know, because we had so much to do, and um, Prabhupada said, sleep less. <laughs> he didn't tell us to um, stop any of our service, or cut down on the service. He got right to the point, sleep less. So I kind of repeated that to make sure that I understood that was actually what he was saying. So, I, you know, and so in other words, you, you know, Swamiji, we shouldn't sleep so much, that we're sleeping too much. He goes, yes. So that was very striking because we, we took our vows and we understood they were vows, but at the same time, it was almost as if we thought, well, maybe later we'll be able to do all these things, <laughs> not immediately. But Prabhupada saw it as an immediate necessity. And in New Dwarka, it was just so sweet here. I don't know, I got to see so much of Srila Prabhupada's 
daily life and what he did. It seemed more here, I guess because I was, his rooms were so private that he could very freely walk about. And of course me, I wasn't a factor. It wasn't anyone he had to uh, talk to or <laughs> he could ignore me as, at will because I was there for him. So he would walk around down the hallway, even in and out of my room if he wanted to see what was on in the floor or <laughs> whatever. And I, so I would always see him chanting, you know, chanting his rounds. And the one time I was in his quarters here in New Dwarka, and Prabhupada was chanting, and, and he was sitting, and I, w I was just sitting in front of him, and he was chanting, and he, and he pulled down his counter bead, and he said, there, he said, now I have finished my 16 rounds. I can do any damn thing I want. <laughs> I was initiated along with Brahmananda, one or two others, uh, on Radhasthami. It was not the first initiation, it was the second initiation. The first initiation was on Janmastami. And I was not there because I was locked up in Bellevue. I was uh, trying to do something for Prabhupada by getting him some income. I told him, well, a lot of my friends are collecting money from welfare. Uh, they just tell them they're not able to work. They're mentally uh, having difficulty. So uh, I went up to Bellevue. The difference was I didn't look exactly like a hippie. I had a shaved head and a sika and uh, wore a dhoti and they took one look at me at Bellevue and they said, oh, just sign here. <laughs> they locked me up. Uh, Prabhupada, uh, I used to talk to Prabhupada on the phone every day and once he said, I'm simply crying to Krishna, how have I, how have I lost this boy? Prabhupada was so loving. But at any rate, uh, by the grace of Allen Ginsberg, uh, we, we, we got out. And well, Actually, that's not true either. Uh, Allen Ginsberg sent us another psychiatrist, a big known psychiatrist. He, he said I, there was nothing wrong with me, that I was simply practicing Vaishnavism, religious uh, uh, sect of India. But that the doctors at Bellevue wouldn't accept that. So I said, uh, what do I have to do to get out of here? They said, well, you best chance of getting out of here is get your family to sign you out. So I called up my family and I said, look, I've seen the light. I want to be a Christian. Just get me out of here. So they came and signed me out. And at the first light, I jumped out of the car. <laughs> I ran back to Prabhupada. How did he greet you? When you oh, he got up and put his arms around me, and he was very affectionate. During the initi initiation ceremony, I remember uh, we were taking the achman, the water, and uh, <clears throat> and Prabhupada. Uh, I was into it, you know. I thought, uh, well, now I'm, I mean, I was a little older. I was 26. I was I was going to give it a good try, you know. This Krishna consciousness. I didn't know anything about it before, but I thought. I was ready to graduate, so I thought, well, instead of before I become a, involved in my, in my career, so to speak, I was going to try this Krishna consciousness. So I was into it, and, uh, and there, we were taking the water, and I was taking it, you know, and, and drinking it, and I was doing it with a little enthusiasm, and Prabhupada turned to Brahmananda, who was there at the ceremony, and he said, oh, he's a good one, <laughs> meaning me. So Prabhupada appreciated that, uh, that we were a little, you can say, forward uh, pushing, so to speak. One of the other services that I was privileged to perform for Srila Prabhupada was that I got to drive for him. And we had one car that had been donated. And of course, coming from our kind of poverty-stricken hippie backgrounds, you can imagine exactly what kind of a donation this was. It was a 54 Ford and uh, the seats, for some reason, wouldn't sit up straight, so you were like this, <laughs> holding onto the wheel. And at any time, the trunk and the bonnet, you know, the, what do you call that front hood, would fly up. <laughs> but we very proudly stenciled Hare Krishna on each 
door, and this was our Krishna car, and this is what Srila Prabhupada was transported in. And I was always very honored to be able to drive him. And I remember one time I was driving, and I said, Srila Prabhupada, um, do you know how to drive? And he said, no. But I had, I think he told me three cars. But anyway, he had more than one. I couldn't imagine how, you know. And I was th seeing this as some mystical situation that he had these cars, but he didn't drive. But later on, when I got to India, I found out everybody who has a car, generally speaking, has a driver. That's the system. So, of course, Srila Prabhupada had a driver for his car. But in those days, when we think, you know, we thought of the Swamiji was like, you know, he didn't do things like we did them. So that meant, of course, he didn't drive his own car. You know, maybe he just got in and sat down, and the car went where he wanted it to go. <laughs> you know? And there was this one road that I would take him on, and it was kind of an elevated roadway. And he, we would say the road in the sky. So I could sense, his first, you know, we could go fast on that road. It seemed like he liked that. So whenever I'd take him anywhere, even if it was totally out of the way, I'd somehow manage to get on this road. <laughs> to take him on this road. The point being, we just we were so eager to do anything we could to, you know, bring pleasure to Srila Prabhupada. You know, the devotees, the non-devotees, everyone who came in contact with Prabhupada wanted to offer something. When I met Prabhupada in Calcutta, uh, Prabhupada first thing he asked me to, was to drive for him. Now, I had been to India oh, with Hayagriva, as I said before, in uh, 65 for just a short time, or seven, three months or something. And Hayagriva and I used to sit up on the roof and look down at all the cars and laugh and say, well, there's one thing I'd never do is drive in India. It was like the height of a, <laughs> a circus. Uh, uh, it was not for a Westerner. Uh, and the first thing Prabhupada said when I got there was, I'd like you to drive for me. All right, Prabhupada, whatever you want. And what did he want me to drive? A great big old old. Chrysler, about 25 feet long or something. So anyway, I was driving him around Calcutta in this old Chrysler. And he told me, go down this way. So we went down the one, this way, and I noticed that all the cars were going the other direction. I said, probably, I think this is a one way. I said, it's all right. <laughs> and we kept going, and at the end of the street was a policeman. Policeman said, "Stop!" Held his hand. And then, when the policeman came over and saw Prabhupada, he said, "Oh, I'm sorry." Gave him right away. <laughs> Flying with Srila Prabhupada was always just an exceptionally blissful um, opportunity, because then again, you you were able to see Srila Prabhupada outside of his devotee community that he had set up when he wasn't with his children and how Srila Prabhupada interacted with people in the, you know, the karmi world. <laughs> and Prabhupada was always, of course, very lovable um, wherever he went and on planes. You know, they often showed him respect and, and would allow him. It was another thing when Srila Prabhupada did get up in the plane, you usually didn't have anyone who would say, sir, sit down. Because <laughs> you, you just had that idea that you know, you weren't going to tell him what to do, you know. Everyone would get that feeling from him that Prabhupada was very much transcendental to everything that was going on. But I remember he asked me a question. He said, so what are you studying at university? I said, sociology. He said, what does that mean? I said, well, we study social problems like uh, alcoholism and different problems we try to. And Prabhupada was sober for a minute, then he said, yes, they study alcoholism, and then after they're studying for the day, they say, okay, now we're finished, let's go have a drink. So he wasn't very, you can say, uh, 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 my impression was that he wasn't, a, he wasn't very mm, inspired by the 
universities, by the education that they're giving. After Lord Jagannath appeared in the temple, there was a very simple ceremony for installation. First of all, the altar was, the room was quite tall, taller than this, and the altar was probably, you see where this adjutment comes out, it was probably that high. It was just a platform coming out, and Prabhupada said to put a canopy over it. So Shamsundra had constructed this canopy. And actually, um, two weeks ago, this Thursday, Lord Jagannath returned to Columbus Yatra, where I'm serving. And we kind of, we don't have him up so high, but we made a canopy, like this old-fashioned canopy. It was covered with a cerulean blue cloth and had some gold fringe on it. So we imitated that original canopy. So there he was up on this very tall platform covered by this canopy. And as an added touch, there was some lights. Prabhupada said there must be lights. So we put these flashers in the light bulbs. So the light bulbs would, sim it would blink on and off, on and off. And um, Srila Prabhupada liked this actually very much, that the deities had these flashing lights on them. Um, we didn't dress them. He hadn't explained to us about that yet. So they were just up there as they are. And he said, now you must offer all your food to them and they must have their own plate, and nobody else should eat off of this plate. So this was actually the beginning of deity worship in ISKCON. The installation ceremony was simply, we put them up and closed the curtain, opened it, and we had one round brass tray with a candle on it, and someone rang a bell, and the tray was circled around, and then passed around, and everybody took turns offering this tray. We didn't even know to go like this. <laughs> but that was the installation of Lord Juggernauth. And probably most of you have seen that famous picture where Srila Prabhupada is in a park. It's Golden Gate Park, surrounded by hippies. Mukunda, Hayagiva, Subal, they're in the picture. And there's Lord Jagannath standing there. Have you seen that picture? So on that day, we were going for the chanting in the park, and we thought, let's surprise Swamiji. He was going to come and join us later. So. Our idea of a surprise was we took Juggernaut. We didn't even take Subhadra and Baladev. We just left them. And we took Juggernaut to the park and just put him down. And I can tell you, Swamiji was very surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and he explained to us that, first of all, Lord Juggernaut never goes anywhere without his brother and sister. That was one thing. And we shouldn't just arbitrarily take him out of the temple that he could come out of the temple on Rathayatra Day. Well, I remember when we first got deities in New York, a small set of deities came in spring of 67, I think it was. Prabhupada gave some simple instructions, and Brahmananda or some of, some of the devotees were complaining, oh, Prabhupada, so many instructions. Are, Prabhupada says, I'm not telling you anything. He said, if I told you all the instructions that there are, you would faint. <laughs> so I went in. Now again, Prabhupada was probably ringing the bell a while because it was my job to answer it. So when the bell rang, nobody else it didn't mean anything to, to his secretary or his, the Sanskrit editor. It was Sruta Kirti, come here. So it may have been, I don't know how long Prabhupada was ringing it. But anyway, I got up to the room and, and offered obeisances. And Srila Prabhupada looked at me and he said, uh, where were you? And I said, oh, I was Sh Mongol Arti, Srila Prabhupada. And he said, no. He said, your job is to be here 24 hours a day. He said, no, no Mongol Arti. He said, if I need you, you have to be there. So I, then, you know, then of course I always like to tell everyone that I was the only devotee in ISKCON that didn't have to go to Mongolarty. <laughs> <laughs> we would go on morning walk from there, so the devotees would come to Prabhupada's house in the morning. And then <clears throat> one morning, uh, it was on an apartment, third story, and uh, we went to the apartment. We were coming out, and we locked the door, and I remembered I left my beads in there, so I asked the secretary, could I have the key real quickly? I get my beads, so I opened the door, got my beads, closed the door, and went down the hall just in time. You know, the devotees were still waiting for the elevator. Then we got on the elevator. So when I got on the elevator, then Prabhupada spoke to me. Just like you would speak to about it, to a, a five-year-old child. And he said in a very slow voice so I could understand, you know, did you lock the door? 
he knew I had left my beads, and he thought, well, maybe I made another mistake. All of the devotees started laughing, but I, I, you know, I could understand that Prabhupada was, I was like a child in Prabhupada's presence. I, I was like a big fool, so I didn't mind. So then we came down on the morning walk, and I remember I was thinking now, you know, Prabhupada's an old man, I have to protect him. And we were coming to the street, it was very busy. Cars were coming this way, that way, and I was thinking, to make sure, you know, I was looking on the left, and the cars, were, it was an opportunity to come and to pass, and I, and I was going to help probably get Prabhupada, and I looked back, and Prabhupada was already across the street. <laughs> he, he was very, uh, you can say, worked very quickly and very bold, and as I felt like a little foolish, I was running after him, thinking I was protecting him, but... Srila Prabhupada was very exacting. A couple of incidents I can give you to illustrate that. One time he asked one of the devotees in San Francisco to find something that that devotee was supposed to have taken care of, and the devotee couldn't find it. So Prabhupada said, oh, it is lost. The devotee said, no, no, Srila Prabhupada, I just can't find it. He goes, well, then it is lost. No, it's not lost, Srila Prabhupada. It's just temporarily mislaid. So Prabhupada said, well, if it's not lost, where is it? The devotee said, well, I don't know. Prabhupada said, if you don't know where it is, then for you it is lost. <laughs> very <coughs> precise, very exacting. On another occasion, it's documented, and I was personally there, his assistant at the time, Krishna Das, was giving some assistance. Prabhupada gave him some mail to be posted. And Krishna Das came back, he said, Swamiji, there is a hole in the envelope. Prabhupada said, yes, that is all right, send. But he was arguing he couldn't send this envelope. There was a little hole. It was like maybe like a quarter of an inch up by the stamp in the corner of the envelope. Suddenly Prabhupada, in a very stern voice, said, no, that all I do is perfect. And this was really very astounding. He, had, he said it with such gravity. It wasn't a a proud boast. It was a very grave statement. And I remember feeling kind of cold when he said that, you know, like a chill, because I was getting a glimpse into the quality in the person of the spiritual master. And Krishna Das kind of straightened also. And then Srila Prabhupada explained that in India, anything coming from America was bound to be stolen or ripped open because they will suspect maybe some money. So he left this little hole so they could look in and see, oh, it's only a letter, and leave it alone. You know. We got our first beads at a head shop. They were big wooden beads. And, uh, oh, probably said, they're very nice. I said, they're not Tulsi, Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, they're better than Tulsi when I chant on them. Whenever he would fly from one place to another, the last thing Prabhupada would do was, um, just like we were flying here, and of course, about 10 minutes before you're ready to touch down, they turn on the fasten your seat belt sign and tell you not to get out of your seat. So for Prabhupada, that meant get out of your seat. You know, he did the exact opposite. <laughs> So they would uh, put the light on and say, okay, you know, you know, prepare for landing and everyone get in your seat. So Prabhupada at that time would use the bathroom and then he would put his tea lock on. And um, then when the plane would land, very often coming from the last temple, Prabhupada was always given so many garlands from the temple that he left. So he would have maybe a half a dozen garlands or three, four garlands on him, which we would put in the overhead compartment. And then when it was time to land, he would say, you know, get the garlands, and I would get the garlands, and he would pick one garland, which he would put on, and then he would say, and, you know, you take the others, uh, so we would all get a garland. But Prabhupada was very careful about presenting himself as a devotee of Lord Chaitanya, and as Lord Chaitanya said, when a Vaishnava is a person who, when you see them, you remember Krishna, you know, that's, that's a Vaishnava, and Prabhupada would put his bead bag on and adjust it very nicely. He would have his bead bag centered and he would fix his, what is it called? Yeah, 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 sannyas, you know. But yeah, he would always um, prepare himself very nicely so that when he made his entrance, because he knew there would be so many, all his disciples would be there at each um, airport, 
that everyone would see the perfect Vaishnava, which of course, no matter how he looked, he was our perfect Vaishnava always, but um, he was very careful to do that. So yeah, the makeup, that is our makeup as uh, uh, devotees is as much as possible to have a tilak on and dhoti and kurta. This is Prabhupada liked this very much. I remember the saying that after the first day of massage, then the next day I told Prabhupada, today I'm going to go to the library to Prabhupada and get a book on how to give a proper massage because I, I don't, you know, I'm not very conversant. I said, no, that is not necessary. You read the Bhagavad Gita and Krishna will tell you how to give massage. So I said, he really didn't, didn't require that we had to study. Then I remember uh, a couple days later, Prabhupada was asking me, so how is your health? I said, well, I have a little problem. I have a toothache. And uh, Prabhupada said, oh, what are you doing for it? He was very concerned. I said, well, actually, I'm going to the dentist this afternoon. He said, oh. So the next morning I was coming and his, his room was upstairs and I would call up Harry Ball and then he'd say, come on, if he was ready. Otherwise he'd say, wait five minutes. So this time he said, come on. I came upstairs and uh, even before I got upstairs, he was asking me, so how is your tooth? And I felt a little bad. I was thinking, well, Papa, I was, you know, it's the most important person on the planet and he, I got him worrying about my tooth, you know. <laughs> but that was the way Robert was. He, he was very concerned about, you know, individuals on, the, on that level. I remember another time in, in, in Tokyo, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, that the Shyam Shunda was traveling with Prabhupada and he was sick for some time and then when he got better he complained to Prabhupada that uh, the devotees didn't properly take care of him when he was sick. And then Prabhupada called everybody, he had Ista Gosti, everybody, and then Prabhupada was saying, why is this? You didn't take care of him. We, we've given up everything, we've come to this side. You know, how is it that you know, we should and then he turned very feelingly to Sham Shunda and he said, uh, with, uh, with intensity and emotion in his voice, he said, why didn't you ask me? I would have come and nursed you and whatever. So that was Prabhupada's mood. You know, he was very, very compassionate. And at the same time, very, very you know, bold and very, very you know, strong if necessary. But, um, but we always got the feeling that he loved us and that it, it wasn't, he wasn't exploiting us in any way. Yeah, he tells us that if, if you brush your teeth with mustard seed oil and salt, you won't get cavities. And, and even if you have a bad tooth, you brush it with mustard seed oil and salt and the worm will come out and be the end of it. I remember when I, we went to Vrindavan, the first time in India, I think we were there for maybe f three, four months. So by the second month, I had, uh, I remember being on a morning walk with Srila Prabhupada. And it was it in Juhu. And Shaima Sundar looked at me and he started laughing. He looked me right in the eyes and he said, oh boy, do you have jaundice? And my eyes apparently were all yellow and showing I had jaundice. <laughs> so then uh, later on, then of course everyone right away said, oh, you have jaundice, which is very infectious, you know, easily contagious just by touching, you know, anything. And, and then the next person touches it and they can get jaundice. So uh, some of the senior devotees were saying, oh, you know, you shouldn't cook for Srila Prabhupada. You shouldn't handle his plates because, you know, he might get jaundice. And we don't want that to happen. So I thought, oh, okay. you know, and I went into Srila Prabhupada, and I was still massaging him <laughs> uh, at this time. And I went in, and I said, Srila Prabhupada, some of your, you know, the devotees are saying that you know, it's better that I shouldn't uh, cook for you or handle your plates or anything or touch you because I have jaundice, and you might get it. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, uh, no. He said, that's all right. He said, don't worry about it. He said, you go on with your service. Then he said, you have jaundice? I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> I was so serious, you know, about yes. And he said, oh, he said, what are the symptoms? Prabhupada, of course, and I'm like totally, you know, totally bewildered, covered over by everything he's saying. I mean, here was Srila Prabhupada, and I mean, besides being always in touch with Krishna and a pure devotee, he was a master chemist, had his own Ayurvedic facility, and I mean, he certainly knew everything about jaundice. But 
I wasn't at all thinking and um, taking everything as I always did at complete face value, you know. He said, uh, what are the symptoms? And I said, well, I said, um, my urine is very dark <laughs> and your, my, you know, your eyes t get yellow, the whites of your eyes turn yellow, I said, and get very weak and no appetite. And he said, oh, he said, perhaps I have jaundice. <laughs> 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 um, and then of course he said so he said for jaundice you drink lots of sugar cane juice you know the cure for jaundice as Prabhupada always used the example about Krishna consciousness um, we chant Hare Krishna to get out of that state so and similarly with jaundice you drink sugar cane juice which there, there in Bombay there was an abundance of sugar cane juice and it was it was the fun part of having jaundice was uh, we were staying at Kartikeya Mahadevi's place at that time, a life member's. And uh, so he arranged, and I, would, I was getting sugar cane juice a few times a day. Robert will often talk about his uh, days uh, as a child. We were, in, we were in, in, in London, of course, on a big estate, and his memories, I guess, were coming about his, the British, and he would talk about the Calcutta in the early days when the British, that was the capital of the... And I remember once we looked out and it, there was one uh, driver that John Lennon had, big man named John. All he did was drive. That was his only service. So Prabhupada was asking about him. I said, I said, yes, that's all he does is drive. And Prabhupada said, that is a sign of a wealthy man, that he can keep somebody who only works in a few minutes a day, perhaps. So then I got a little enthusiastic about it. I said, yeah, Prabhupada, he's very, very wealthy, John Lennon. And as soon as I did that, Prabhupada didn't like it. And he said, what is the use of all this money? He doesn't know how to spend it. And that, that really made sense to me because at the time, John was excavating a big area to make a lake. And then they spent so much money. And then later on, they changed their mind. And they decided not to have a lake. And, you know, practically we saw that people had money, but what was the use of it? They didn't know how to spend it properly. So that was a good lesson. We were in England until 1970. And... It was actually very difficult initially. We had no money, nor could we work. And um, we didn't have any initial contacts. And so it was quite a struggle to just maintain ourselves. We would be separated sometimes, living in different boroughs even, which is like different districts all over England, all over London. But we were really united and focused in our desire to get a center for Srila Prabhupada. And I related the story of Shamsundra meeting the Beatles um, the other morning. Um, I, could, I don't know if I gave the exact detail about how he did it. Did I tell how he... I can tell it's kind of a sweet story that he found out where they were recording and he went to the recording studio. But the recording studio was like an armed fortress not really, because in London you can't have guns, but I mean, it was quite well protected. And uh, there was just like no way to get in. There's these like automatic doors and a guard there. But suddenly this Rolls Royce came up. And Shamsundra was not exactly inconspicuous. He had a very shiny shaved head. This, in, in those days we all wore yellow, the men and the women. And it wasn't like a subdued form of yellow. It was usually a pretty vivid yellow. The dhotis were yellow, our saris were yellow. So he had this yellow dhoti on, very yellow, and a bright blue Nehru jacket. So it wasn't like he could just blend in with, you know, any of the locals. So up came this car, this big Rolls Royce, and the gates opened. So he got down in a hunched position on the opposite side from where the guard was. And, of course, the drivers are also on the opposite side in London. So he was on the, pa you know, on the passenger side, and he got down, and he started, like, going in with the car. And the window came down, and this little head came out, because, oh, you must be George's friend. It was Yoko Ono. So she said, come in. So he, he got inside like that. And they brought him in, and he sat down in the little lobby. And then George came out, and he goes, where have you been, man? I've been waiting for you guys. So that was the initial introduction to the Beatles. Now, 
that we had been trying, I mentioned to this, we had been trying to contact them to get their attention, and we'd done all kinds of really silly things. We had sent letters, when they had a company called Apple, so we had got wind-up apples, that if you, they had little feet on them, if you wound them up, they'd walk around, and we'd put little, you know, we had the wind-up apple with a little Hare Krishna on it, and we'd sent one of those. We'd, made, we'd sent apple pies with Hare Krishna written on them. I mean, we'd sent tapes of Hare Krishna. We had done anything and everything we could to get their attention, but this is how it was finally obtained. And uh, Prabhupada was actually very pleased by this. He was pleased by the record. He felt that it was very significant. We, we didn't have a center at this point. Still, we didn't have a center. And we were going all over, we, were being, we made this record, it was number one, and we were being sent all over Europe. We were very actively preaching, <laughs> but we still didn't have a center. And this was a very discouraging thing for us. On one hand, it was so exciting. On the other hand, we didn't have a center. So somehow we got Bury Place during this period. Um, and we were living at John Lennon's house because Bury Place was not inhabitable immediately. And um, we were just waiting for Prabhupada. We wanted to get it finished so that Prabhupada would come. But Prabhupada, the minute he heard we had a place, came anyway. So he was also living with us at John Lennon's place. And we'd go daily, send devotees in for Harinam into downtown London, and people would come back. So people were joining us. Even though we didn't have a building or a center or any facility, they were joining us. So by the time we actually opened Bury Place, there was already devotees that had been actually initiated at John Lennon's place. And um, quite a crew was there. Coming from the airport, there was a sign along the road that said, detour temporary inconvenience, permanent improvement. Prabhupada laughed and said, all we ever see is the temporary inconvenience. There is no permanent improvement in this world. After a morning walk, and Srila Prabhupada always would, you know, they would let him out front there and then he would walk into the side door. And then you had the foyer there and then he would walk up the stairs. So whoever was on the walk, at least six or eight people would come inside and just be chanting, Jai Prabhupada, Jai Prabhupada, and, and Prabhupada would be walking up the stairs just so regally. And at the one time we were all sitting there and just looking, and Jai Prabhupada, and, and Prabhupada would look at us. I remember it was Kirtanananda and myself and Kaladri with some of the New Vrindavan. We were all New Vrindavan boys. And Prabhupada looked down with a smile, and he had his cane, and he said, uh, and he looked up the stairs, he was like halfway up, and he said, uh, he said, I want to run up these stairs. <laughs> he said, and I used to run up these stairs. He said, but now the body won't allow it. He said, and then of course he went on, and he said, this is how we can understand, we're not this body. I mean, everything was in the immediate, it was an example in showing us in our in our young ways and saying, he said, that desire is still there, it's unchanged. He said, I still want to run. He said, but now, he said, I can't. Of course, we know anyone that was with Srila Prabhupada on a morning walk, no, he practically ran on the morning walk. It was the most amazing thing. His, his gait, his pace was in, incredible. So that also was a, a bluff of Srila Prabhupada's, but he used it to instruct us about the spirit soul. We were preaching, of course, in the city. We were staying in John Lennon's estate, but we were going regularly for programs. So there was one uh, big program that was like the first time in London. And we were all there with Prabhupada in the evening. It was, uh, and, and then uh, <clears throat> Prabhupada was very strong in that program. There were many uh, Indians were there for the first time. And uh, they were challenging. Some of them were saying, you know, what about Lord Shiva, and what about this? And so we were just sitting, and Prabhupada was very forceful. And I remember once he, one man stood up, and he was interrupting, and Prabhupada said, sit down, you are nonsense, in a public hall. So it was that kind of a mood. And then after, of course, Prabhupada established Bhagavad Dharma. And, uh, so the next day I was giving massage, and it was, it was due to be a series of lectures. 
So again, he was going to speak that night. And so I was like in the mood of giving, you know, getting him in shape for another knockout performance, you can say. Like a trainer and a prize fighter. And, and I was talking and I was, I was talking adamantly, you know, not adamantly, but vividly or, or with life, vividly about Prabhupada and, and what he's done and, and so on and speaking and speaking and glorifying and flattering him. And, uh, and then suddenly Prabhupada said, no, with a very emphatic, authoritative voice. And then my hands like froze on his body. And then with another voice, just like a little child, like a six-year-old boy, he said, I am just a humble servant. And when he said that, I really felt that I didn't have any right to touch his body. And I was such a plebeian, and he was such an aristocrat. And, and uh, I, the only by his mercy that I was even allowed in the same room with him, or to speak of touching him, that he was so such a high-class person. And I, I felt like going, like going under the rug or something. To, but uh, that was a wonderful lesson for me, to, that, that I could see that Prabhupada really thought of that of himself that it was his real identity, that he was a servant. He wasn't a big, he didn't think of himself as a big something. He thought of himself as a servant of his spiritual master and, and he wasn't impressed with some kind of flattery. So that was a very nice exchange for me. So the opening of the London Center coincided with the um, installation of Radha London Ishwara. And there was one very significant instruction that um, I always remember at that point in time, that there were so many people, it was so crowded, and it was going on for hours, this whole affair. And some people had to leave, and Prabhupada looked, and he said, oh, they were leaving, give them prasadam. And the prasadam was late, the offering hadn't been done. And they said, it's not ready yet. He said, there must be something. No one can leave without prasadam. And so he had the devotees immediately cut up some fruit and put it on the altar and at the same time pass it out. You know, we're like going through the process, you know, ringing the bell, saying the prayers, doing our Gayatri, this whole thing. And, you know, the devotees are thinking, oh, it's not offered yet. You know, like, and he's passing it out. And Prabhupada made two points at this time. He said, first of all, no one should ever leave our center without getting a little prasadam. You know, we're thinking prasadam means a plate full, you know, something, a little prasadam something that's been offered to the deity. And then he said, factually, as soon as it touches the altar, it's offered. You know, and it's a, an instruction that we should you know, you know, really consider that anybody who comes should get something, you know, a little something. I know, and I, I try to follow these instructions in, in, in my center because these, this is, you know, for us, this is the heart of Krishna consciousness. This is personal instruction to Sri the Prabhupada, to his disciples, to his devotees, and to the devotees of the future. And we could see by what happened that day, what's so difficult to cut up an apple and an orange, because that's what it was, I remember, and, you know, offer it and pass it out. It, Prabhupada was getting ready to leave. We've been there for three months, and I was a little attached to the service, so I wanted to stay with him. I wanted to continue that service. I wanted to go to America. Actually, he was going to Boston. So I was asking if it was all right if I could come, and he said, let us see. He never said no. But one day his secretary came and he said, you know, you should stop bothering Prabhupada about going to America, that Upendra is there, he's going to do that service, and uh, it's already settled, so, so you can't come. So that, that day I was giving massage and I said, uh, Purushottam, your secretary, said Prabhupada that, uh, that uh, Upendra was, is going to do the, the uh, massage when you come to America. Actually, we were alone. It was in a car. I was driving Prabhupada to the temple from his apartment. So Prabhupada was silent, so I knew it was true. So I was a little, you know, a little discouraged, but I thought, well, after all, I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't disturb Prabhupada by that. So I, I, I could see that he was a little sober. And it, so I thought, let me change the subject and just make another subject, and, you know, so he doesn't feel like. So I said, uh, so Appendra is going to do this service, Prabhupada? Who is this Appendra? He's a good boy? As I never met Appendra. And then Prabhupada appreciated that. He kind of, he turned to me. I was driving the car and he turned to me and he said, he is not as nice as you. <laughs> but very feelingly. And so Prabhupada could see that I was sacrificing, you know, that I wasn't going to 
insist, you know, my right is I should be able to come with you, I've asked you, and so on. I was renouncing that, and uh, and Prabhupada appreciated it. It was was a nice exchange. So then one afternoon after lunch, he called me into his quarters in Dallas, and uh, I offered obeisances, and then that's when he said so. He said, uh, Shruta Kirti. He said, your name is too long. (laughs) He said, I'll call you Shruto. (laughs) And I said, okay, Srila Prabhupada, I thought that was okay. It was was so interesting, because it certainly isn't one of the longest names the Prabhupada gave out, but, um, you know, how he was, why and um, why he said it and why he did it was just, it was such a wonderful thing. And Prabhupada started calling me Shruto. And for the next few days, you know, he continued to look at me and smile and say, Shruta, I mean, I I can only imagine that he saw me. I was such a total, you know, incompetent, silly little kid. And and Prabhupada found me amusing, you know. He gave me an amusing name, which is also, Shruta is a um, Sanskrit uh, word. It's a bona fide name. (laughs) And then he said, so, he said, um, he said, do you take a nap after lunch? And immediately, it was whenever Prabhupada would ask these kind of questions, you would get a little tense because you thought he was, it was a test, you know? <laughs> and like you had to give the right answer because you didn't want to fail his test, you know? Like, <laughs> like if you gave the wrong answer, then you weren't a good devotee. So of course, and I, I wasn't at the time. I learned very quickly though with Srila Prabhupada that you took naps because his schedule, he stayed up very late, which I never did. And then I started to with Srila Prabhupada. And I said, oh no, Srila Prabhupada, <laughs> I don't take naps. And he said, oh, he said, that's very good, he said. He said, I'm an old man, he said, so I have to take a nap after eating lunch, he said. I have to take a nap sometimes. But it was just was so wonderful. And I'm thinking, like, why is he? Like, I had no question about what Srila Prabhupada was doing, but it was like he was explaining to me about his taking a nap after lunch. And I thought, he's just, it's just everything he did, it just made you love him more and more. I mean, even this was all within the first week. So all these things were going on, and uh, Prabhupada was just so patiently taking care of me and instructing me and even explaining his own schedule to me, um, which was it's just, to me, it just showed such an amazing amount of um, humility. It was like Prabhupada had this humility there. Um, and I often said with Srila Prabhupada, he would ask, he would call me into the room and said, so can you give me massage now? And again, my job was 24 hours a day just waiting for that bell to ring. But even at that time, it wasn't that you walked into the room, offered obeisances, and he said, let's go, massage time. You know, it wasn't his mood. <laughs> he would say, you know, can you give me massage now? And in the morning, it was like, um, can we go on walk? You know, can we go on the morning walk now? I, I mean, always the devotees were just waiting for Srila Prabhupada, like for him uh, to set the pace of what was going on. But Srila Prabhupada had such a marvelous way of, of always uh, making us more and more attracted to him. You know, every word he said uh, just endeared us to him. Oh, well, there was this one boy named Stradish. Uh, he would love to eat chapatis. And then somebody got the idea, they claimed they heard it from Prabhupada that one should only eat two or three chapatis. So they told Stradish, and he nearly went crazy. <laughs> he went to Prabhupada and he said, what is this two or three chapatis? Prabhupada said, you can eat 20 or 30 chapatis, that's all right. He says, an old man like me can only eat two or three. But if you can digest them and use the energy for Krishna's service, you can eat 20 or 30. So in that, he was illustrating the point that you cannot make up rules like that for everyone. It is not that everyone should only eat two chupatis or that everyone should just do this or do that. Krishna consciousness has to be pursued in a unique way for everyone. There are as many approaches to Krishna as there are individuals. That's why Krishna says, I am in everyone's heart for helpfulness, granting knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. Krishna is in the heart of every living being. He wouldn't have to be in the heart of everyone 
if it were the, if Krishna consciousness were the same for everyone. But it's not the same. The principle is the same. Always think of me. All that you do, do for me. This is the place where these kind of things always came up. It was about the end of the world. <laughs> people were always leaving New Dwarka. Even in, I guess, last year, another row of people left New Dwarka because the comet was going to do something. And uh, at this time, it was Rupanuga. I uh, wanted to see Srila Prabhupada, and, and he had me come, and we were in the room together with Srila Prabhupada. And, and uh, Rupanuga said to Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, um, I heard it said that Sruta Kirti said that you said <laughs> that World War III is going to start. I don't remember what the date was. It was 1978 or 76, something, you know. And uh, Prabhupada just you know, furrowed his brow and he looked at me and he said, Did you say that? <laughs> And I said, no, Srila Prabhupada, I never said anything about a word. Like, to me, it was, you know, and still it was like the furthest thing from my mind was, you know, I'm completely, I was convinced I was ever youthful anyway. I wasn't going to die. I wasn't worried about a war. So um, I said, it wasn't me, Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada looked at him and he said, I've never said any such thing. And then he said, uh, they may say that Prabhupada said, this, Prabhupada said that. He said, but unless you hear me say it, don't believe it. <laughs> yeah, as we were moving in, the devotees were setting up Prabhupada's desk, so Janaki was there. She called to Prabhupada. She said, uh, Srila Prabhupada, where, where do you want the lamp? And Srila Prabhupada said, yeah, just keep it there next to the picture of Prabhupada. So we, we kind of all stopped because we never heard Prabhupada refer to his spiritual master as Prabhupada. So Prabhupada picked up on the fact that we were all looking at him and he said, yes, I have my Prabhupada too. So that was a nice remembrance of how Prabhupada was uh, you know, appreciating his spiritual master. Little by little it took us to learn who and what was the spiritual master. And Srila Prabhupada was challenged in so many cases by our ignorance, by our lack of spiritual education. You know, I remember one young woman coming during a lecture. And after the lecture, she raised her hand. She goes, well, Swamiji, I don't agree with you that, you know, that we shouldn't have illicit sex. I don't think there's any such thing as illicit sex. And I think sex is a good way to know God. Yeah. So Prabhupada tried to speak to her reasonably, but she was adamant in her position. So finally Prabhupada said, all right. He says, but I have brought only one medicine. Please take it. And he began kirtan. There was a very nice exchange that Prabhupada had uh, with one of the parents of, the, of his disciples. Uh, it was in Detroit, 71. We were just uh, looking in the window. Uh, actually, we just just do that. We, we, would, we would listen and look in the window and watch Prabhupada when he was unobserved. And he didn't seem to mind. He, so he was uh, talking to this mother of the devotee. And she was about 50 years old. And, and so she spoke in a, like as one adult to another to Prabhupada. She, and she said to Prabhupada, she, to Prabhupada, she said, you know, the, these young boys and girls, they actually worship you. You know, like, like a confidential thing. And Srila Prabhupada uh, understood the purport immediately, and he said, he said, yeah. He said, I'm also worshiping my spiritual master. That is the process. That is our process. So in this way, the whole, it was diffused, you know. Ordinary people would think, oh, this is very unusual. You know, a person, a human being is being worshipped. But Prabhupada made it just like, a, like an ordinary thing, that this is, the, this is the process. I'm also worshiping my spiritual master. They're worshiping me. It's not something extraordinary. It's the, it's the tradition. It's the pr parampara. Uh, <clears throat> then, of course, the lady, she, she couldn't say anything. She just had to accept. What made the greatest impression on me 
was his ability to turn everything into Krishna consciousness. No matter what you spoke about, he could relate it to Krishna. No matter where he was uh, or what he was doing, it was always in connection with Krishna. And it was a practical demonstration of Bhagavad Gita. Always think of me. What all that you do, do as a sacrifice for me. And that made me realize his uniqueness. One uh, kind of humorous story in relationship to that was uh, about a year later when I went, accompanied him to India, he asked me to wear my gray flannel suit. Now, this was not just a gray flannel suit, it was an almost black gray flannel suit, heavy gray flannel suit. And we went to India in July. When I got off the airplane in, in Delhi, it was like being hit by a ton of bricks. The air was so heavy, hot. And, and here I was in a gray flannel suit. And not only, the, not only did he have me wear it on the airplane, but there in India, when any time we went to visit an ashram or, some, or his godbrother or something, he would say, wear your suit. I mean, he, he had no consideration that this would be very uncomfortable. It was simply that it was advantageous for Krishna. And he, he's right in that way. We should overlook bodily comfort and discomfort in order to serve Krishna. That is our only criteria for anything. How does it serve Krishna? I, again, wanted to leave as his personal servant. And my experience in being with Srila Prabhupada, that he was never very anxious for me to leave because he knew I was useless otherwise. And at least I, you know, rolled japatis okay. I could bring him japatis and I massaged him decently. It was basically a nice, very good rub down. Um, but anyway, I was back in Hawaii, and now I had a wife, and I had a child, and I guess I was torn in so many ways. And I said, Srila Prabhupada, I want to stay in Hawaii and stay with my family. And uh, I said I wanted to preach. <laughs> I said I felt the need to preach. And he said, uh, my preaching's not good enough? <laughs> <laughs> So again, he just, you know, wouldn't, you know, wouldn't give me the, wouldn't make it easy for me to leave. And it, of course, this is, you know, I have so many, so many regrets. I've done so many things wrong, so many things wrong in my life. Um, and uh, this was another one. Of course, I had the opportunity to be with Srila Prabhupada. Uh, but like so many of us, um, when I left his personal service in 1975, I figured, you know, he would still be here now in 1997 I didn't see the urgency that these were the last you know these are the last minutes you know this this time there's just so many days Srila Prabhupada is going to be with me and I, I should just give up everything and surrender my life and just stay with him just like he said you can't get that moment back so you know, I got to experience that you know I get to experience that every day and uh, so that's why I was very enthusiastic to come here, and I just wanted to talk about Srila Prabhupada as much as possible because then he, he's uh, alive with me. You know, I, I can feel him. And through everyone that's here, you know, I'm able to uh, get Prabhupada's mercy. So the, we would go every day to give massage at his apartment. And I remember once I was chanting, while I was waiting, he was finishing his correspondence. So he looked up and he said, you listen when you chant Hare Krishna? So I was thinking, you know, my immediately my response was defensive. I was thinking, of course I listen, otherwise why am I doing it? So he kind of, he read my mind. And he said, I know you listen, but you have to listen very carefully. This chanting is the whole essence of our philosophy. Sometimes Prabhupada would say there were very big problems. He'd say if your mind is really disturbed, uh, do you know what he would tell you to do then? 
chant loudly. That's exactly what he said. He said to me right here, he would say, chant loudly. And he said, I do that. <laughs> and he did do that. Um, his, the things that agitated, if I can use that word without being offensive, Srila Prabhupada's mind were never material. But certainly Prabhupada became concerned about uh, goings on in the society. Uh, and at this time, I remember right here, and that was in the beginning of when I was his servant, uh, there was the Juhu Project. Which, and the Juhu Project occupied a lot of Srila Prabhupada's time. Uh, he was very much concerned about it, that Krishna uh, was able to remain on that property that he had acquired. He said the deities were there. And he said, once Krishna was there, he said, I was not going to let that man take them off. And his disciples didn't always have the fortitude that Srila Prabhupada had. They didn't have that conviction. And over and over again, uh, they would be ready to, to give up the project and think, we can buy another piece of property. You know, I mean, they would say these things to Srila Prabhupada. Why don't we get another piece of property? It's, this is too difficult. Um, and we, we can do something else. We can do the project somewhere else. And, and regularly people were, after some time, literally defeated uh, by the government of India, by Mr. Nair, in so many ways, they were just uh, wiped out. And these were the things, when Prabhupada would get these letters and he would get telegrams, you know, such and such is left, uh, <laughs> or saying, why don't we do this? And Prabhupada would just become so, so upset. And it would be in the evening and you would see him in, in his quarters here and he would be walking, pacing in the hallway through his quarters and chanting very loudly, <laughs> very loudly, uh, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. And he beads, and Prabhupada would walk. When he walked, um, especially here, I, I, I remember just so finely how Prabhupada always walked and he would have his hand behind him like this as he walked, very straight. And you know, he would move his, his beads in his bag and so he would be moving them and chanting. And, and he said that. He said, I do that, he said. If the mind is very disturbed, he said, then chant loudly. Srila Prabhupada was very, very well received. And one of, one of the, he, he got a standing, around, or at least he got a, a big round of applause at one point. He was saying that it's putting the difference between Krishna consciousness and the Christians. So he said, Dear Lord, give us our daily bread. This is not love of God. This is love of bread. And all the students were cheering, you know. <laughs> so he had a very nice way of presenting a point clearly. <laughs> When I accepted sannyas, uh, I got a danda, of course, and Prabhupada said, you are now Sri Dandi Goswami Kirtananda Swami. And uh, Sri Dandi, we are Sri Dandi sannyasis. And that means th three. But I said, Prabhupada, there are four. There are four rods in here. What's the fourth one? Prabhupada scratched his head and said, I'll have to consult higher authority. So in a day or so, he came back and said, uh, the three stand for body, mind, and soul. And the fourth is jiva. We add an extra for jiva because jiva is always distinct. We never merge. So he was always fighting the Mayavads. <laughs> I was asking Prabhupada sometimes, 1969, whether he thought I should remain brahmachari or get married. And uh, Prabhupada said, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can be Krishna conscious from any ashram. This is the main thing, just to be Krishna conscious. And, and so I accepted that. But then once he was giving lecture there, and he talked about how he was, he took sannyas and how he was thinking, how can I leave my wife and family and children. And, but somehow my spiritual master was p coming to me and 
in a dream, and my godbrother was pushing me, and so I took sannyas. He said, now I have so many children, and without the botheration of a wife. So that next day when I gave massage, I said, Srila Prabhupada, you were saying that yesterday in the, in the talk, in your lecture, that a wife was a botheration. The Prabhupada looked at me, and he smiled, and he said, I said that? <laughs> With me, he was always like non-committal until he asked me to take sannyas a couple of years later. But, you know, it, it was something, because he, could, he saw I was a little older, and then I, if I wanted to take sannyas, or brahmachari, remain brahmachari, he, was, he wouldn't object. If I wanted to get married, he wouldn't object. It was like that. One devotee who was in Mexico City, and I believe was the first sannyasi fall down, and uh, he had gotten married and he already had a child, and he came to Srila Prabhupada and he was so afraid of taking Srila Prabhupada's darshan. And he came in and he offered obeisances and he said to Srila Prabhupada, um, and he explained how in Chaitanya Charitamrita, when Chota Haridas even glanced at a woman, Lord Chaitanya told him, go. And he said, so Srila Prabhupada, you know, do I have to go? <laughs> and Prabhupada said, Lord Chaitanya, he said, he can make the whole world Krishna conscious in a second. He said, but me, he said, I can't do that. He said, I need all the help I can get. <laughs> So he said, whatever you can do, he said, now in the household or ashram, of course, as he said to so many, um, when it would happen, uh, whatever service you can do, you just now be content. It was so incredible. Even when sannyasi would fall down, he said, well, now become a content grahasta, become peaceful. That's what Sri Prabhupada would say, be peaceful and do service. And Prabhupada was just, just wanted to... Um, follow the orders of his spiritual master and, and spread Krishna consciousness all over the world. That was the West, the Srila Prabhupada. Was every, <laughs> everything was West <laughs> of Mayapur. So Prabhupada took in the whole world. So he, whatever it took, Srila Prabhupada could accept it and he could burn up all our impurities and offer that service to his Guru Maharaj. Probably one of the most notably successful um, places was Surat, where Srila Prabhupada was treated in such a way that we had never before experienced. And we started to understand that we didn't know how to honor and respect our spiritual master properly. Um, he was treated like the saint. That, and Prabhupada, to call him a saint, I think, is shortchanging him, but he was treated like a saint. He was garlanded, garlanded, so we'd have to remove some of the garlands and still more would come. He would, we would go down the street and people would pour flower petals on him. Um, the streets were decorated with rice, um, rouse, rice flower drawings that the ladies would get in their hands and they would so expert at letting this rice flower come through their fingers and make these elaborate drawings along the street and on every doorstep. Sandalwood paste would be liberally applied. We hadn't seen that up until that point. He was honored so wonderfully and so gloriously. And as he was honored, they were also honoring us, um, not on the same level, of course. And it was during this period that actually Sham Sundar became the secretary of Srila Prabhupada. That um, for some reason or other, he was feeling some personal dissatisfaction in his life. He felt like that he wasn't doing anything or doing enough. So he felt like he wanted to leave, go somewhere else. And when he said that to me, I thought it was like pulling a scab off a wound. It was just painful. It was like very painful. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't say anything. And um, I remember I ran upstairs to Prabhupada's room as soon as I could you know, get away. And I just went into his room and I was sitting in the back part of his room in kind of a shadowy place. And he said, so Malati, what is wrong? Right away he understood something. And I remember I just said, it's Sham Sundar, he wants to leave. And he says, bring him to me, tell him to come and see me. So I felt some relief, but then I'm thinking, oh, you know, what will Sham Sundar think? And if I say like, so I, I went down there and I tried to be very casual. I said, 
uh, Swamiji, you know, Prabhupada wants to see you. <laughs> <laughs> and immediately, though, it was immediately he went up. And after some time, he came back. And it was like he went up. He was feeling so morose at that moment. And you know, I, I, I couldn't at that time conceive how anybody could be around Prabhupada and be morose. But um, if you're not really situated properly in your service, it's possible to be morose. And if you're not properly being attentive in your chanting, it's possible to be morose. Prabhupada said, if you're not feeling happy in Krishna consciousness, then you know, you're not properly executing your service. You're not properly situated. It's not that the Krishna consciousness is wrong, but we're not properly situated. So he went up, he was you know, tinged with this moroseness. But when he came back, it was like another person was coming back, and he said, Prabhupada has asked me to be his secretary, and I have accepted. So it was immediately he began, right away, he began to be Srila Prabhupada's secretary. And I was massaging Srila Prabhupada and a devotee came in and he was very concerned. He was a senior devotee in the community there. And he said, Srila Prabhupada, he said, the leader here, he's not chanting his rounds. <laughs> he said, I know for a fact he's not chanting his 16 rounds. And Prabhupada's sitting in. And he said, so how, you know, how can we follow? such a person, and Prabhupada just sat, and he said, uh, Arjun wasn't chanting his rounds on the, on the battlefield, <laughs> he said, there was a great war going on, Kurukshetra, he said, so Arjun was busy doing his service, he said, so he didn't have time to chant his rounds, he said, so he may not be doing that, he said, fighting such a battle. He said, but still you should see it like that, that this devotee is doing so much service, perhaps he doesn't have time to chant his rounds. Uh, you know, another thing which was, was um, always you saw with Srila Prabhupada was he always asked us and directed us to subscribe in cooperation with one another and, and in following the chain of command up to himself. Uh, he always did this. If there's some difficulty in the temple, then you go to the temple leader, the temple president. If that doesn't work, you go to your GBC man. He very much wanted us uh, to be able to uh, work together that way. He always stressed that cooperation uh, with one another. Um, there was another time there was a, a devotee wasn't chanting his 16 rounds and, and uh, but he was doing a lot of activity in the temple and a lot of business and he was manager of the temple as well and and Prabhupada says well what is the use of his management he said if he's not chanting his rounds <laughs> so Prabhupada could give different understandings and depending on who he was talking to as well you know and that's one thing um, especially in this environment and talking about Srila Prabhupada's pastimes um, you know we have to understand them just who he was with, just like myself, when uh, he was talking about chanting his rounds and finishing his rounds, and Prabhupada dealt with all of us personally. Um, he said, everything is there in my books, you know, all the answers are there in my books, and that's you know, for philosophy, uh, for all of the answers to our questions, that's where we have to go. But when Prabhupada was here with us, he was also very merciful, and he accepted you know, whatever little service we could do, hoping that it would ignite that, that spark, you know, and turn the spark into a flame. So he was very kind to us. So I remember one time in the, in the later days, 1977, Srila <coughs> Prabhupada was in his room in Mayapur, and uh, one of his godbrothers was there. And they were talking about the history of the Gaudiya Math and how the Gaudiya Math had failed. And had not remained united as Srila Bhakti Siddhanta had wanted it to be reunited. And Srila Prabhupada was speaking very, you know, you can say respectfully because it was his god brother, very, but he was also speaking very authoritatively. And when he spoke on this point, he spoke with full conviction. He said, it is my opinion that the difficulty was they tried to create one Acharya. And he said, you cannot create Acharya. 
You cannot create. Acharya may emerge, but you cannot create. But they tried to create, and therefore everything was spoiled. Uh, so I remember Prabhupada spoke with, with full authority on this point, and, and this is a very important point that actually philosophically has, has helped me over the years, that some people may claim to be Acharya or something, but it's not an easy thing to just... And so Prabhupada gave us the GBC as a workable system, that we, although we may not know any of us individually, but the faith he had that collectively we could keep on the right course. So I, I saw that Prabhupada was very strong in this point and that about creating somebody artificially every year another Acharya. Prabhupada impressed me by his certainty. Prabhupada didn't say, I think, or maybe it's like this, or probably this, and Prabhupada was never like that. Prabhupada, it's, it's this, it's this, and it's this. There was no question. I didn't have, again, I, when I was Prabhupada's servant, uh, I didn't know a lot about anything that was going on in the society. Uh, I wasn't even interested in, in hearing so many things. I just was doing my service. So I don't have a lot of understanding about the whole Juhu project. But I do, um, you know, there were different things that I saw and how Srila Prabhupada was so much determined that this is where you know Juhu project was going to develop and uh, is what had finally happened when it came to an end well it didn't come to an end it came came to one conclusion we were in New Zealand and I was massaging Srila Prabhupada <laughs> um, the reason I'm you know so many of these things happen on massaging Srila Prabhupada are because if I wasn't doing these things, then I wasn't with Srila Prabhupada, so that's why I'm, I always sound like I was massaging Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> <laughs> and I was behind him. As Again, I was always behind him when I asked him questions, and it seemed like he was in front of me when he answered me. So that was my, I guess that's the appropriate position, right, is to be behind, always behind your spiritual master. And... Uh, as I was massaging and um, Tushta Krishna comes into the room and he had just gotten a phone call from Bombay and in the phone call uh, they told Tushta Krishna that Mr. Nair had died well of course Mr. Nair was you know he was the big demon who was doing all these creating all this disturbance for our, you know beloved Srila Prabhupada and putting him through so much so much difficulty, so much anxiety, and he was dead. So uh, he came in and, and said that. So I was, uh, actually, it was, it's all wrong. <laughs> I answered the telephone and came in and told Srila Prabhupada. And then I w went behind him and started massaging him again. So when I told him, Srila Prabhupada just put up his hands and said, Thank you, Krishna. <laughs> And I was, <laughs> you know, again, me and my foolishness, I was thinking, ooh, somebody died, you know. <laughs> and I was thinking, that's, that's not a nice reaction. <laughs> Probably I was all glad. So I said, um, I just kept massaging. I didn't touch it. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, he said, uh, he was such a demon, he said, he created so many difficulties for me. I mean, you could just, like Srila Prabhupada just going through, and that's what, again, with Srila Prabhupada, like, when Srila Prabhupada thought about things, it's like he lived them, you know, he was like living the experiences, you know, Prabhupada was, it was like the eternal platform, like everything was happening as he was thinking about it, it seemed. <laughs> And he said he created so much difficulty for me. And uh, he said even Prahlad Maharaj says that when a snake or a scorpion is killed, you know, that's, that's good. He said, so he was, he was a snake, he said, Mr. Nair. He was a great snake. 
But um, he said, yeah, you know, he said, the last time I saw Mr. Nyer, he said it was in Bombay, he said. And uh, it, was, it was funny, too, though, that's how Prabhupada did battle, just like, you know, the great Kshatriyas. You know, they would battle, but when they weren't battling, they were very cordial in the evening, you know, they could speak together. And, <laughs> and Prabhupada, he would speak with Mr. Nyer so calmly and casually, but, you know, he was happy to see this man die. And yet he could speak, when he spoke with him, it was just businesslike, and he was cordial with him. He said, but when I saw him the last time in Bombay, he said he was limping. He said, I noticed he had a limp. And he said, and Mr. Nair was a very robust, energetic man, he said. But when I saw that, I thought, he's going to die. <laughs> <laughs> so all this is going on, Prabhupada's talking and relishing the, the moment, and I'm massaging him. And I said, <laughs> so now I got into it a little bit. I said, so Srila Prabhupada, I said, you know, said he was a great demon. So does, does that mean that Krishna killed him? He said, no, he was not that great of a demon. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he said, and he said, I didn't care. And he said, and my disciples, he said, it was difficult because so many of my disciples were, didn't understand. He said, they didn't understand. He said, um, and they thought, you know, why is our spiritual master so attached to this piece of property. He said, but I didn't care. He said, we have money. We can buy property anywhere. He said, I didn't need that piece of property. He said, but as soon as we bought the properties and then we built the temple, which was just a little concrete piece, and put the deities on the, the altar. And he said, once Krishna was there, he said he was not going to be removed. He said, I could not allow it. He said, for myself, I didn't need anything. And it was just like everything just came together all at that moment and seeing how Prabhupada just, just so transcendental, you know, in everything that was going on. I mean, that was a battle that went on for years, you know, for years. And I remember, um, again, not being part of it at all, but just seeing things at different times. Devotees, they would import devotees from the West. I remember, I remember Bhagavan, I don't know if you were when Bhagavan came to Bombay, and, you know, everybody was just, it was like, you went to battle and you, you were licking your wounds. You would come from the lawyer's offices and um, you could just see that people were devastated. They just want to leave India. It's just like, let's just get out of here. You know? Just being in India was difficult in, in the early 70s. And then dealing with this in Bombay was impossible. And I remember one day Bhagavan coming in to Srila Prabhupada in his office and said, you know, I'm here, Srila Prabhupada. I'm going to take care of this. And he had, you know, Bhagavan was you know, always looked neat and dressed in silk and all. And I just looked and I just smiled to myself and thought, I wonder how long this will last. <laughs> Which, it's very, we were very bad in India, right? We always had that outlook on everyone, <laughs> just kind of pessimistic outlook on everything there. And, but sure enough, I mean, it couldn't have been more than a few days. And, you know, his, his nicely groomed hair was just kind of all over. It was like, he was a... <laughs> It was another war casualty. <laughs> have any of you been to India and have any of you been to Jaipur? Jaipur is full of monkeys. So the minute I'd start cooking, the monkeys would assemble. And they were really bold and they would grab things right out of the pot. Sometimes I usually cooked in the three tier cooker, but sometimes I'd be frying something and they'd come and just grab it out of the pan. And it was one day I was just like really frustrated and, and Prabhupada told me, get a stick. He says, but don't hit them, just show the stick. And that day he let me use his cane. So I, when the minute I picked up the cane, I mean, it was like magic, the monkey split. <laughs> but he explained, if you hit them, they'll become angry and then they'll attack you. But simply shake the stick at them. So I would shake the stick, I'd have the stick, after that I got my own stick, but that day I used Srila Prabhupada's cane, and the minute one would come near, I would shake the stick. Then at that, another time, it was past time in that room in Mayapur, Prabhupada, uh, 1975, Gopal Krishna Maharaj was the GBC for India. So he came to me and he said, uh, 
Bhavananda is going to be leaving Mayapur, so Prabhupada wants you to stay and be co-directed with, with Jai Pataka. So I said, I'm not going to stay, Gopal. I already have a plan. I'm going to preaching in, in the Far East, and uh, I have some devotees going to go with me, and I'm not going to stay here. So then later in the afternoon, I was in Prabhupada's room during Darshan, and Gopal Krishna was also there. Many devotees were there. And Gopal Krishna raised his hand. He said, Srila Prabhupada, Jivikram Swami says he's not going to stay here in Mayapur. And there was a silence, and Prabhupada looked at me and he said, So, what is the problem? You, you, don't, you don't want to stay here? I said, Well, Prabhupada, I already have a program. And Prabhupada said, Our formula is plain living and high thinking, but you're simply addicted to the city. And then uh, I said, But Srila Prabhupada, uh, you know, this is... Uh, this, Preaching here in Mayapur, I, I don't, I'm not very enlivened by it. You know, I'd rather go there. And he said, "You are sannyasi. You've given up everything but your whim." And still, I was objecting. I said, "But Prabhupada, I've been a sannyasi for five years, and I haven't had a chance to preach, because everywhere, you know, and in English, there's an, I've, I've always been in the Far East or somewhere where I couldn't preach in English. If I stay here in, in, in Mayapur, I won't be able to preach." So Prabhupada said, "Oh." You've been a sannyasi for five years and you haven't had a chance to preach? What makes you think you know how to preach? So then I, something inside me said, yes, sir. <laughs> like I was in the Navy and you know, I just kind of was trained up to respect superior a little bit. But at that point, I, I realized that Prabhupada was my superior. I better just shut up and do what I was told. And so he, I stayed and for some time. I remember once asking him about where we should put the well, dig for a well. He said, ask a local farmer. That's, that's an important instruction in a way. We shouldn't bother the spiritual master with questions that can be answered easily and probably better from the mundane point of view by an expert. Krishna consciousness does not uh, throw away the expertise of material persons, but they engage it in Krishna's service. So he taught us that from the very beginning. I also noticed um, in the evening where Srila Prabhupada would walk around and he would be chanting and he would be pulling down his counter beads like he was completing his rounds and it was just such a wonderful thing to see and he's you know again he said to me um he said when i was a householder <laughs> he said i would chant uh, four rounds in the morning and then four rounds before each meal he said, and in this way, I would get my 16 rounds done. And he said, and this is very effective, he said, because if you don't chant your four rounds, then you can't eat. <laughs> so, so he said he practiced this process as, as a householder. And he said, so, you know, he would always say, you can do these things. You know, it was practical. Everything was practical and everything we could do. And then I heard from Prabhupada's secretary, Upendra, that the devotees in, in Japan had been thrown out of the country, and that our society was in jeopardy. So I was a little disturbed because I had spent three years in Japan, and I, and I kind of felt that the, you know, the devotees who went there, headed by Guru Kripa Yasa and were, were like in a mood, in a passionate mood a little bit, collecting money, and they didn't care so much for the, for the, the society being registered and keeping it. So I went in in that kind of a mood in Prabhupada's room. As soon as I heard it, and I, he probably was alone, I said to him, I knew this was going to happen. I just blurted out. He probably looked at me like, who's this aborigine coming into my room? And then I said, now we're being you know, thrown out of Japan and, uh, and we had Radhakrishna deities there. And so Prabhupada kind of sat on the bed and he became a little sober and he said, I did not want that, that, that this should happen. So then he said, all right, so you can go back. And I was like shocked. I said, oh God, what have I done? And I, I, I opened my mouth now and I'm going to have to go back to Japan, which I didn't really want to do. But that was the way Prabhupada dealt. If you had an objection, a complaint, 
then you had better also be ready to make a solution and not just to go there and lodge complaint without being you know, ready to put your neck on the line, so to speak. And so the next day, I told Prabhupada, yes, I'm willing to go back if you, that's what you want. And, and he sent me back. I, I went back with Shatadanya and we kept the center open and kept the deity worship going. I personally was the Pajari. But it was a, it was a good lesson that, uh, because it's so easy to criticize. But Prabhupada didn't appreciate that unless we had the positive correction. To, otherwise, it's better to shut up. Um, actually, during that time, I was cooking um, and cleaning. There was a couple things. One was, I remember one day I was cleaning the room, and I never could go out on the walks because I would be cleaning the room. And I, always, I had to make sure the room was clean by the time he got back, and at the same time, simultaneously, breakfast would be served. And I remember one day I was putting the desk back together, and it, was, it seemed like a very small thing. I had the pen, and I knew it went on that side of the desk, but I couldn't reach, and I was like, my mind was already out in the veranda to get the prashadam ready. So I put the pen down on the other side of the desk. And later when Srila Prabhupada came in, he said, who has touched my desk? And of course, I mean, he knew I did it every day. But that day I had not returned the pen properly, and you know, he said, do not change anything. And it was very profound because I realized how Prabhupada was so careful and that every moment was precious and valuable to Prabhupada. So when he had his desk so precisely arranged, he'd sit down, he'd pick, he, he wouldn't waste a moment, immediately begin his work. So he reached for his pen, and of course, where was it? Then, you know, you know we're Americans, we're so casual in the way, you know, we could say, well, what's the big deal? It was right over there, you know. But Prabhupada saw everything as belonging to Krishna, including time. And he didn't want to waste time. And so he was extremely precise. So, you know, I, I was feeling really ashamed at that moment that I'd caused this inconvenience to my spiritual master like that. And then uh, I was deputed to drive him from the airport to the temple. And I was reminding him a little bit about, I was talking, again, I was quite adamant in talking and, and uh, reminding him about my experience with him in London, in case he had forgotten, you know, and, uh, and saying how, uh, asking if I could give massage while he was here. I was driving, then there were three devotees in the back, the GBC, they were quiet. And uh, Prabhupada was also quiet, I was the only one talking. And asking him that. I said, oh, you have been, uh, I asked him if he had been to Russia. I heard he had just gone to Russia. And I said, so what was it like in Russia? Tell me, you know, how, how was it? You were in Russia, Prabhupada? And Prabhupada just said, yes. But he didn't, he didn't get into conversation with me. He didn't want to, you know, become like my buddy and start to <laughs> jibber-jabbering with me like an equal. And, and everybody in the back laughed because the way Prabhupada did it, it was clear that he was like, Telling me that okay, cool it, you know, just shut up a little bit and just let me, uh, you know, talk as I see fit. Not uh, you don't be pumping me for questions. And so, although Prabhupada was very humble, he could also be very, very straightforward. And uh, you know, he would go right to the point, and he wouldn't, he wasn't embarrassed to be blunt and to to be uh, uh, <coughs> personal. And one time, the, one of the most wonderful times was in Bombay, where Prabhupada just started telling so many stories about his childhood and talking about his mother and his father and his sister and their interactions. And it, Prabhupada always talked about his father uh, so fondly and always credits his father for doing so much for him, as we you know, all read and, and heard so many times. And is what he said that night in talking about his father how he used to, he said, whatever I wanted, my father would give it to me. And then he was talking, he said, sometimes it would be late at night and I would want puris. And my mother would say, no, not now, you know, it's too late. And then my father would say, no, if he wants puris, give him puris. He said, so then she would have to make puris. He said, my father was like that. <laughs> He said, whatever I wanted, I could have. And he said, um, 
perhaps my father knew. And then he stopped. So, and to me, um, again, it's just my understanding and being with Prabhupada, how he was, it meant perhaps his father knew just what an exalted personality Srila Prabhupada was and what he was going to do uh, in later years. It was just very clear that's what he meant, you know. And it was just, it was just so nice to hear him say that. So I'm Prabhupada understood, but at the same time, you know, pure devotee understands everything is coming from Krishna. You know, Prabhupada genuinely understood, I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing anything at all. And, uh, you know, that's something if we advance in Krishna consciousness, we can realize anything that's happening is only by Krishna's arrangement. So after the deities came, that was in December, after some time there was discussion about the Indian Yatra. And one day we got a letter from Srila Prabhupada and there was a list of 11 persons. And he said he wanted these 11 persons to meet him in India by September 1st, something around there, September 9th maybe. So myself and my husband and my daughter were, my daughter was the 11th person on the list. So we became very focused on going to India. And we had no idea what, again, it was like going to England. We didn't know anything. We didn't know anybody. We didn't have any money, but Prabhupada wanted us to, wanted us to go, therefore we were going. So Shamsundra arranged some incredibly cheap airline tickets. Actually, this airline company that we took to India was so cheap that it didn't even have, it wasn't a jet, it was like a prop plane. And there was this rope or a wire that went from the tail to the cockpit where the pilot was pulling for when they made turns. There was not like a water fountain or anything. There was like this barrel of water with a dipper in it in the rear end of the fuselage. And there was just a piece of burlap over the one bathroom. This is the uh, plane that we went to India in for our first trip. <laughs> and after we landed in Bombay, they grounded this entire airline company. It was called Brothers Air Service, and it never was allowed to fly again. <laughs> <laughs> but we got there really cheap. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so we landed in Bombay. We had, you know, there suddenly there we were in, in Bombay. We didn't know where to go, who to go to, or anything, you know. And uh, suddenly these people came up and they're giving garlands and telling us to come with them. And we were going with them. And we got to this house and they said, Swamiji will be here shortly. So it was everything was like, oh, it was just like a, a, a miracle or a fairy tale unfolding, you know, just the way it was happening. Prabhupada came, we were offering obeisances, and they said, go out and Harinam. It's like, bla you know, we just come from England, and it was like blasting heat, but immediately he sent us out on the streets of Bombay to perform Harinam. We, it was immediate. <laughs> we were in Bombay, 1976 or so, and Srila Prabhupada was there, and one, one uh, yogi came. And he was adamant, I mean, not adamant, but animated. He was lively and discussing with Prabhupada and back and forth. And, <clears throat> and somehow it, the, the talk came to the point of a spiritual master. And, and then I got into the conversation. I said, yes, this is the basic point. We have to accept the spiritual master. And of course, I was thinking that, you know, this man should accept I was a spiritual master. But Prabhupada immediately picked up with, on it and he looked at me like, you know, shut up. Get out of this conversation. It's over your head. Don't be lecturing to this guy. He, didn't, he said that just with his eyes. He didn't say all those words, but I, I could understand that. That was the purport. That, you know, probably had a relationship with this man, and he didn't want me to be telling him that, you know, you should... telling him anything, really. And this, he was an advanced person. It was a nice lesson. Oh, and Prabhupada asked a question. He said, so... The devotee, he is simple or he is crooked. And, and one of those disciples said, oh, he's simple, Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, yes, so the devotee is simple or crooked, you're sure? And he said, yes, Srila Prabhupada, he's simple. And he said, Prabhupada said, no. He said, the devotee, he is crooked. He said, just like me. He said, I've come here and I've tricked all of you. <laughs> 
in the becoming devotees of Krishna. I mean, actually, you can see, <laughs> you know, we come here um, to be happy, <laughs> to enjoy in Krishna consciousness. Of course, and we can do that, but one has to give up everything to Krishna. So this is the trick Srila Prabhupada did. And it was <laughs> he tricked us in now. If you want Krishna, you have to surrender everything. And then you can have Krishna. So that was his that was his trick. Faith begets faith. So it's Prabhupada's faith that generates your faith. And similarly, if you have faith, you can become a preacher. If you don't have faith, you can't be a good preacher. You can only convince people when you're convinced. If you have doubts, they'll have doubts too. Another time, he was uh, discussing with another important person and uh, in Bombay and there and uh, and then uh, I during the lull in the conversation I started to say something and Prabhupada looked at me like you know what are you doing <laughs> what are you doing now but I quoted some verse which was appropriate to the to Prabhupada's point that he was making about how uh, <coughs> we should be eager his eagerness is the price. Uh, even greedy, greedy, lo yam, mu yam, eklam lo yam. So I'm just. So when I started, then, then then Prabhupada saw that I was contributing something. Then he immediately took it and was animated, and he continued preaching. And so we could speak in front of Prabhupada, but you better be sure that you you know, especially when he was preaching, you better be sure it was something that like that you could feeding him, so to speak, and and understanding the mood he was in, and and otherwise if you just change the subject or something, Prabhupada could become very disturbed. <clears throat> Another time we were on the morning walk in Vrindavan and it was a similar thing. Prabhupada had been speaking and, and coming back and then I started, I spoke, I said, this reminds me of a teacher I had when I was in the university, Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada looked at me again with that same look. This better be a good story. <laughs> Everybody stopped, you know, and Prabhupada stopped and and then I told the story how he, he was a big philosophy teacher, but when he became sick, he changed his philosophy. So Prabhupada had been sick at the time. This was 74 in Vrindavan. So when I told that Prabhupada, then he laughed and he said, yes, we're not changing our philosophy because we become sick, and so we appreciated that. But sometimes, you know, I, you, you say, I said things that were wrong, inappropriate, and he, would, uh, he wouldn't hesitate to to chastise me. Even in the last days when he was lying on his bed, he couldn't even move. I said something inappropriate and, and Prabhupada was, showed his displeasure to me. He, uh, he was talking about the doctor who was coming from Calcutta, the final doctor, and he was asking his secretary. Actually, he called his secretary, and Kamal Krishna Maharaj, and I was along with him, but, but he was asking him uh, questions, and then at the end of that, he, then he said, he changed the subject. He said, so has he left yet? And I thought that he was talking about the doctor. So I jumped in and said something inappropriate. I said, yes, he's already left. And then everybody was quiet. The whole room was quiet. Tamal Krishna, very intelligent, he didn't say anything. And Prabhupada looked at me and he said, who did you think I mean? And I realized I was on thin ice and I started backpedaling and saying, well, I guess I was just speculating, Prabhupada. Who did you think I mean? He, he wouldn't let me off. He just kept on pushing. And I said, I was talking about the doctor. And then, then Prabhupada didn't say anything, but he just turned on his bed and he gave me you know, like a cold shoulder. <laughs> he just, he turned his shoulder and it felt like it went right into my heart. He didn't say a word, but just a gesture, a slight gesture. And I felt, oh boy, what have I done? disturb the spiritual master, especially in these days when he was... And then, he, then Tamal Krishna Maharaj said, who, who were you referring to, Srila Prabhupada? And then Prabhupada said, my son, because his son had been there also and he was due to leave. And So then he started talking and they explained. Well, of course, the greatest example of his compassion was 
that he left Vrindavan uh, in his old age to come to uh, the hell of New York f just to bring us Krishna consciousness. That's compassion. To me, the most, uh, you can say, striking quality of Prabhupada was this, his ability to encourage everyone to, you wouldn't say flatter, but to somehow you know, get them to make an attempt to sacrifice for Krishna, to sacrifice for their own good, for the sacrifice for a spiritual life. That he, he was so expert at seeing a little good quality and fanning it and making it come up. And I, I remember thinking at one time, this is the most extraordinary thing about Prabhupada, that he he's really has a, a, this wonderful ability. And because it, and every, that's why he attracted so many people, because everybody could see that he, he was seeing the, you know, the best in me. And that was the first impression that Prabhupada gave, you know, that he would see the best in you. And later on, of course, he may correct you, but that was, because you knew it was out of love, he, he actually knew, he saw the best of you, so you always had the feeling that he was your well-wisher. Whereas a teacher, ordinary person, even parents, you know, they, they, you always had the feeling, well, maybe they're a little envious, or maybe there's a little motive there, but with, not with Prabhupada. That was, I thought, was the most impressive qualification that he had such compassion and still does, as you say. And we need it, otherwise, without his mercy, what is our position? <laughs> if I realized anything, that's what I've realized, that without Srila Prabhupada, yeah, you know, no life at all, you know, no reason for existence. One of the things, again, going back to, you know, my youth and our youth, and I remember here again in New Dwork with Srila Prabhupada on the Vyasa song giving class, and I remember him doing things like that so many times and just looking at his watch and saying, you say, now it is 732, you know, and now that's gone, and you can't regain that moment again. You know, it's gone forever, in eternity. And I literally used to sit there and think, well, we're eternal, like, why does that matter? <laughs> That's how, you know, foolish, you know, I am and how foolish I was. And I, I couldn't understand, you know. And he would say, if you waste that moment, you can't get it back again. If you waste it in Maya, you can't bring that back and be Krishna conscious. And... You know, I was on the computer and I was writing that and like I just had this realization that Prabhupada's gone. <laughs> like I was there with him, you know, like right at his feet. And uh, and I was wasting all those moments. So that's what I want to get back, you know. I can tell you that last year I had a wonderful experience. I was invited to Brazil. And there the devotees in South America were very isolated. They only had Prabhupada's <coughs> physical presence one time. He went to Caracas. So very few of the devotees in South America have had actual contact with Sri the Prabhupada. Even their initiating gurus there, uh, Vishwara Maharaj told me he only saw Prabhupada one time, very briefly, here in L.A. But their mood of Prabhupada is so powerful and strong. And they're serving him so enthusiastically that in that beautiful temple at Novo Gokula, I was feeling the presence of Prabhupada at every moment. And every devotee there was focused on Srila Prabhupada to the littlest one to the oldest one. And their <coughs> oldest one was 92 years old. <laughs> but there was no doubt about it. Their Guru Pujas were among the most enthusiastic and personal Guru Pujas that I have experienced anywhere in ISKCON. And yet, they had most of them never even seen Srila Prabhupada personally, so called but they are seeing him daily. He is making his presence manifest for the pleasure of these sincere devotees.